Welcome back to Grade 7 History, Unit Number 2, Conflicts and Challenges in Canada, 1800 to 1850. This is Lesson Number 24, Why Did the System of Government in Canada Change? And how did different groups try to overcome political changes in Canada? Before we begin today's lesson, let's consider the following. What changes do you think the British government made so that there will be no more rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada? You might actually want to stop this video, go back and watch the video for lesson number 23 as a quick refresher. But if you're confident in your memory of our previous lesson, Go ahead, put the video on pause so you can write down your response to this question. And let's begin. The Upper and Lower Canada rebellions made the British government realize that the system of government in the colonies was not working. However, the British government did not want to give more power to the reformers. Queen Victoria sent John George Landon better known as Lord Durham, to find out the causes of the rebellions and to find ways to end tensions in the Canadas. I'm just going to draw your attention to this interesting looking painting on the left. My question for you is, what does this painting tell us about the British monarchy and politicians who influenced Canada's government overseas? Let's put the video on pause for a second. Consider what you feel about this painting. Jot down your ideas and then we'll continue. All right, moving on. Upon his arrival, Lord Durham learned about the conflict between the Executive Council and the Legislative Assembly. He found the conflict was worse in Lower Canada, where the French-speaking assembly refused to approve executive laws that would benefit British business. In 1839, Lord Durham sent his report to Queen Victoria. His report had three main recommendations. Durham's first recommendation was that the executive and legislative councils should no longer be appointed or chosen. He believed that members of the executive should be elected, but still elected by wealthy white men. After spending a lot of time in Lower Canada, observing the relationship between the Canadian and the British, Durham recommended uniting the Canadas. Durham believed that in a united Canada, the English majority could run a stable government. Finally, Durham believed that the Canadian's way of life was outdated. His final recommendation was that the Canadians be assimilated. In other words, they would give up their French culture and adopt the British way of life. The British government rejected Durham's recommendation of responsible government, but it liked his final two recommendations. The Act of Union, 1840, joined the Canadas into one colony named the United Province of Canada. So finally, we're at a point where we're talking about one single Canada. The government was made of representatives from Canada West, formerly Upper Canada, and Canada East, formerly Lower Canada. English was the only official language of the government. Canada West and Canada East received the same number of elected representatives. And so here's a little flow chart showing how this system worked. So you had the crown, the king or queen. They chose the governor general. Okay, the governor general uh, would then oversee the executive council and the legislative council. Uh, but here you had the House of Assembly. And you had 42 MPs from Canada East, 42 MPs from Canada West, and they were all elected by the people, or rather the wealthy white men of the United Province of Canada. Now, a point out again. Both Canada East and Canada West got the same number of representatives. So something for you to think about is what problem 
could you see with Canada West and Canada East getting an equal number of representatives? And we'll talk about that tomorrow. The Canadiens were outraged by the Union Act. Louis Hippolyte Lafontaine, or a former leader from Canada East, was in charge of making sure that the government and the public followed the law. Lafontaine joined Robert Baldwin from Canada to West in pursuing responsible government in Canada. Although his fellow Canadians saw Lafontaine as a traitor for working with the British, he later gained their trust by speaking up for them in government. In 1848, Baldwin and Lafontaine won a majority government. It was the first time the English and the French had achieved a political goal together peacefully. By 1849, Baldwin and Lafontaine convinced the British government to give political power to the elected Legislative Assembly. Canada now had a responsible government. And when Baldwin and LaFontaine were in power, Canada's capital was Kingston. Today, the statue of Baldwin and LaFontaine stands on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. An early victory for responsible government was scored in April of 1849. Earlier in the year, Baldwin and LaFontaine introduced the Responsible Losses Bill to compensate people in Canada East who had lost property during the rebellions. This angered the Tories and public protests were held. Lord Elgin, the new Governor General, still signed the bill as he realized that if he did not, he would damage the foundation of responsible government. And here's another interesting painting. The protesters went so far as to burn the Parliament buildings in Montreal. What message do you think the protesters were trying to send to Elgin and the government? So think about it for a minute, jot down your response, we'll talk about it tomorrow. So put the video on pause. And let's proceed. Lord Elgin's signing of the bill, along with Britain's new trade policy, damaged the relationship between the Tories and the British. The Tories felt betrayed that the British had not stopped the bill. As well, the British introduced a policy of free trade, a system in which countries trade goods without charging each other taxes. This meant that Britain was now trading with other countries first and Canada second. Canadian merchants now had to compete with merchants all over the world. So here we see a political cartoon showing a rather portly looking lion. My question for you is, what is the artist saying about the British in this political cartoon? And then I'll put the video on pause, take a closer look, and then we'll talk about this cartoon tomorrow. Papineau and Mackenzie were eventually allowed to return to Canada. When he came back in 1848, Papineau called for the end of the Act of Union. When Mackenzie returned in 1849, he was elected to Parliament and continued to criticize the government. However, both men found that their views and calls for action were no longer supported and both retired from politics in 1851. And this is the house that Mackenzie was living in prior to the rebellion of 1837. Years after he returned to Canada, the people of Toronto purchased the house and gave it to him as a gift. The house is now an historic site, and there's even a printing press on the bottom floor. And you can actually go there throughout the year, and they will give tours of the house. First Nations continued to meet resistance from the government regarding land rights. Millions of acres around the Great Lakes were taken from the First Nations and given to British settlers. The Ojibwe chief approached Lord Elgin for help, but none was given. In order to hold on to the land they lived on, some native people used European farming techniques to show the British that they were just as entitled to the land, even if they were not European. So just look at this picture. What European influences on this native community can you see? And we'll talk about this tomorrow. 
During the 1800s, Canadian women were not included in the political process and they were not allowed to vote. To voice their concerns about the government, women would write to newspapers. Since newspapers, and men in general, did not welcome their opinions, many women wrote under a different name in order to protect their identity. And this is an example of one such paper. La Minerve was one of several newspapers which received letters from women who wanted to express their concerns about government and the political process. Under the old Constitutional Act of 1791, certain landowners and tenants were allowed to vote. There was no mention of whether they had to be male or female. Some female landowners took advantage of this and voted in elections. Unfortunately, reforms to provincial statutes, or laws, of Canada in 1849 took away the right of all women to vote in any election. As a result, Canadian women could not vote in federal elections until 1918. Women in Quebec had to wait until 1940 to be able to vote for the provincial government. So, for all his talk about a responsible democrat government, Louis-Joseph Papineau believed that women did not want to vote and should not be allowed to vote. In the early 1800s, free public education was not available for all children. There was very little government funding, few public schools, and some communities could afford a teacher's salary. Well, some could not. Education was often available only through tutors or in private schools. Of course, only the upper class could afford to send their children to these schools. Governments in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island began to partially fund schools in the early 1800s. And in the 1800s, schools like Picton Academies and Upper Canada College actually charged parents by the course. So parents paid a certain amount for math, a certain amount for language, French, and so on. During the 1820s, demands and petitions for a public school system grew. People campaigned for more public school funding throughout the 1830s and 1840s. Egerton Ryerson was by this time the reformer in charge of developing public education in Canada. He agreed with the calls for change from parents and teachers. Eventually, because of public demand and Ryerson's own passion for educational reform, the Canadian government passed the Common School Act in 1846. The act created a system of free schools with standards for teacher training, funding, and textbooks. And here we see Ryerson University today, which takes its name from Egerton Ryerson. Unfortunately, there were still barriers to education for certain groups. In an effort to assimilate the First Nations, the government recommended that Native children should attend boarding schools based on farms. The plan was to separate Native children from their parents so that they would be taught a European way of life and would forget their traditional lifestyle. So, sadly, the residential schools were effective in assimilating many First Nations children. Many students returned home after graduating and were unable to communicate with their parents. Black children attended segregated schools, schools where students were separated by racial group. Black children were not given the right to attend any school they wanted. Mary Ann Shad was a black Canadian activist who worked on increasing access to education for black children. She eventually opened the first desegregated school in Chatham, Ontario, which meant that students of all backgrounds could attend school together. So, three questions for the wrap-up. Number one, who do you think benefited more from unification, upper or lower Canada? And why do you feel this way? Second, how was Baldwin and LaFontaine's willingness to work together to create responsible government still relevant to Canadians today? And finally, how are the contributions made by Egerton Ryerson and Marianne Shad still important to Canadians today? So, for his final history lesson, I'm going to put the video on pause so you can write down your responses to these three questions. If you don't feel confident, 
means you need to go back and watch this video at least another couple of times. When you're ready, put the video on pause. All right, and just before I end up this recording, I want to thank all of you for a really great semester in grade seven history. I look forward to one final rousing discussion based around the questions presented here. But until tomorrow's class, this concludes today's video.